it and you kind of wash out a lot of that if you maybe think about a reduction with multiple clusters and the clusters have some network structure but it, it, it's a first step anyway yeah well, it should be interesting yeah it's very hard to do right but um i'll be interested to listen to it yeah yeah What are, what are you working on at the moment? Well, Mosh and I, we, we've, done, we're, we've done a bit of work. We've got, so Mosh's talk today will be on neural fields, balanced networks. So we have new equations for that, which we're still testing, but so far they look pretty good. So cool. this is like highly disordered neural networks, but there's no plasticity. Hmm. Um, I, I, I have papers on new main field reductions of networks with plasticity, but it's often hard to get very tractable expressions. But, yeah. Um, yeah it's it's topical yeah um yeah and, and like effective noise on patterns that's the work i've got going, ongoing um and various other things as well but, yeah i'm also i'm going to be stopping by new york when i'm over in the u.s so i'll be meeting with oh, uh, oh you should come by yeah when are you coming by um friday week i think so yeah this day next week oh i won't be around yeah but I, i'd say hello otherwise <laughs> are, are you giving a talk or you just no just, just okay. up, yeah <laughs> yeah um well okay uh, okay i'm sorry <laughs> to stop okay. you robert do you want to to try to share your screen or are you confident it works sure yeah i might as well um i can uh I think I'll give my talk with uh, with my video off uh, because I've been having some internet bandwidth uh, issues today. If, if if everything goes smoothly, maybe I'll turn it back on, but it might be better to give it with my... I don't think it's necessary anyway, so... Um, but sure, I'll go ahead and share my screen now and try Perfect. out... Uh, you can see everything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Actually, one thing I wanted to see, can you see these... How do these animations look? Are they... Can no, you see what's going good, on at good. least? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, yes. okay, great. Just wanted okay. to make sure. I wasn't sure how they would translate to. No, it's fine. Zoom. Okay, great. I can, uh, Thank you. Stop there. Uh, and yeah, I'll, I'll try to set up a background image in, in place of my uh, video just to save bandwidth. Okay. Olivia, do you want to test if you succeed to share your, your presentation? Uh, okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Hi. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> um, oops, I don't know exactly what I'm sharing right now. But I think. So now. Yeah, I can see it. Do you see it full now? now? Uh, it's I'm not, not full screen. No. It's not full screen? Okay. No. So, yeah. So now it should be fine? Mm -hmm. Yes. Perfect. Perfect. Should I unshare or give it to Okay. Thank you. Do you want me to unshare? Or? Yes. You can do, stop to share. Okay. Um, so now. Okay. Sorry. I can see it. Okay. Um, do you know if Mark is uh, with us? Uh, He's West James? Coast. He might join a bit later just because that's why we're swapping speakers because um, it's very early in the morning for him. So he might okay, be late. Okay, so he, he's not the first speaker. Yeah, we're, going, we're swapping the order. Um, so apologies. Ah. To those who yeah, so Mosh is going to go first. Okay, do you, 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 I don't remember, you, you sent this uh, new organization to, to Daniele or? I believe so. I should have updated the document. Uh, yes. Okay, I print uh, an old one, sorry. No, 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 no. 
on, no, no, no. On the on the website, uh, Mark yeah. is the first speaker. Ah, so, okay. It's... We did we did not know that uh, we changed the order. I think. Did you send an email? Or... What I did, maybe it didn't go through. I, I don't know. Okay. So I'm uh, sure that. Yeah, I remember Danielle saying something about there being a switch within a session, but I don't know if it was this or, and then maybe you forgot. To no, I, I think it, it was in, in a Tilo session. Oh, okay. And I, I remember I have exchanges with Tilo with exactly the same question. Someone uh, oh, so. in, in the West Coast, in the US. We should kick off soon, right? Because it's 2.10. Uh, sure, so I start to record, fine, uh, James, it's a great pleasure to, to give you the microphone in order to present the parallel session you have organized and with Chernao on patterns and risk in balanced neural network. Please, James. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thanks so much for joining everyone. So we're, we're looking at, as Etienne said, at patterns and rhythms in balanced neural networks. So our first speaker is going to be Moshe Silverstein from New Jersey Institute of Technology. So he's, um, he's going first, then we have Olivier Gozel, Robert Rosenbaum, and then finally Martin Goldman. So I'll go over to you now, uh, Moshe, if you can start sharing your slides. Okay, okay go for it. Okay. Thank you, James. And uh, good morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever one might be, find themselves around the world. Thank you so much for the opportunity this morning to be able to talk to you about some of the research we've been working on. So today I'd like to talk to you about some of the work we've been doing on neural field equations of balanced neural networks. So to start off with, uh, I'd like to just give a brief overview of mean fields and their applications to mathematical neuroscience in the form of neural field equations. So borrowing from such fields like statistical mechanics, mean field equations are a method of capturing the behavior of high dimensional stochastic models by studying a simpler model that approximates the original by averaging over the various degrees of freedom. So in essence, we're reducing the effect of all other individuals of any given individual by approximating a kind of net averaged effect, thus reducing a many body problem to a one body problem. In neuroscience, we use such equations to reduce a coarse grained macroscopic description of the activity of a large ensemble of neurons. One of the earliest and perhaps well, well best well known uh, such equations are the Wilson Towering equations, where the mean level of activity in a group of neurons is captured by the equation integral differential equations. Uh, where x is the location and t is time, and we take the convolution over the other neurons. So we're convoluting over neurons y in order to get kind of this net effect on neuron x. These equations have the great result in their ability to generate phenomena such as traveling waves and localized bumps, and have been very successful in kind of doing this. So it has been proposed that the observations such as the, the temporal variability in firing neural network neurons uh, can result from such equations where models uh, or models that approximate balance state between excitatory and inhibitory inputs. Characteristics of such models are, are net excitation much greater than the firing threshold balanced by inhibition inputs and require substantial fluctuations above the long time mean to fire. Such a model was first successfully explored by Sempolinsky, Summers, and Cristiani in 1996. Next, we can introduce models that have a random structure to them. A prime example of this, perhaps, is the equations introduced by Sempolinsky and Cristiani in 1987. Here, the connection strength between neurons are sampled independently from a standard normal distribution of variance one. These are then multiplied by a nonlinear gain function uh, indicated here by lambda, and are typically, which is typically a bounded sigmoidal function. Uh, sigma here is going to represent the magnitude of the white noise, and the j sub jk's are going to be the strength of the network's connections between the various things. 
between the various neurons and are not necessarily, in fact, are explicitly not symmetric in this case. This is in contrast for most mean field models where the interactions are not random. The strength scale scales as one over N and the scale difference from the mean is with high probability, much less than one. Such models have therefore been shown to be able to support stable sy synchronized solutions. Again, because of the scaling of one over N and the large N limit where we kind of average out and it, you, we can support synchronized uh, solutions. Random networks, however, don't support synchronized solutions as the effective field does not correlate with the mean phase. Because even if the individual neuron were to synchronize, the effective field does not correlate with the mean phase would never really be stable. So because of the because of the J, the J terms, basically the, the average effect has to permeate through this uh, complicated network. And it's we, in essence, uh, have, it has been shown that, that you can't really get stable, uh, stable synchronization. Uh, in order for us to make this a little bit more rigorous, we can define an empirical measure as a measure over the stochastic path space. Capital G can be thought of as the net affluent field and is a random centered Gaussian probabilistically independent of the white noise with self-consistent covariance. Sempelinski and Cristiani found a self-consistent mean field equation for the limiting dynamics of such, such an empirical measure in the large N limit. In other words, they were able to find a solution a distribution, the law of the system, even though uh, at first glance, it's a highly self-consistent, uh, somewhat uh, circular kind of uh, system of equations. Nevertheless, um, they were able to show that you can indeed define a law for the system. This model, however, is difficult to analyze due to the non-Markovian nature of Equation. In other words, it requires the entire history of the system at each step in order, to, in order to solve the system. This can be gotten around by taking the long-term equilibrium of the system, at which point the covariance is understood to become stationary. However, with, we then lose insight into the short-term phenomena that can be of great interest. So it was able to be shown, in other words, it was able to be shown that in order to get around this, we take the large M limit. However, the model does become uh, we do lose quite a bit of information by doing so. So, so as powerful as these mean field equations are, they suffer from the following few drawbacks. They are hard to proceed analytically, even on short time scales. It is hard to study the dynamics of the system in kind of a classical sense in order to find uh, fixed points and, and stability of such using kind of more classical uh, dynamical system approaches. And their, their accuracy is not always clear over the long time scales. At the large N and the large T limit is, you, you, they define well over the large N limit, not necessarily always clear to define them over the large N large T limit. Introducing spatially varying connectivity into the model also makes, can make them rather intractable. So this, Again, even though these models have been extremely successful, they do unfortunately suffer from some of these um, kind of draw these kind of drawbacks, and have always been understood to be more of a kind of uh, you know paradigm a set of equations to kind of capture the essence of the dynamics of the system while sacrificing some of the kind of more biological, intuitive, intuitive and tractability of the scaling of the system. So the main contribution uh, that I'm going to be kind of presenting today and the work that we've been working on is a, is a model that consists of autonomous equations, meaning they do not require the entire history of the system, only the current state in order to, to be able to be solved. Uh, these equations represent the large M limit of the random neur neural network and can be extended to the spatial uh, heterogeneous case. I'll show you kind of, we'll try to show you both this, the spatially homogeneous and spatially heterogeneous case. And this will allow us to be able to study non-equilibrator phenomena and can be studied using kind of more classical techniques of dynamical systems. Uh, in essence, we're actually gonna be able to reduce our system down to a system of ODE. So it becomes quite, uh, quite manageable. It is worth noting that the 
that the first to obtain spatial extended uh, some Belinsky Scrisati uh, equations were Tubal and Kabani in 2013, to the, best of, uh, to the best of my knowledge. So we're going to start with the spatially homogeneous case. The first kind of massive key to, to the approach that we're taking is that we define that we can approximate the increment in G not being dependent on X. So a big, again, a big drawback to some of the earlier models was that the um, increment in the net affluent field, capital G, is dependent on X of T, which can be thought of as capturing a lot of, again, the entire history of the system up until that point. Whereas we're gonna take the approximation that, oh, and that can be kind of captured in the source equation I have here, where we see the kind of, kind of the with convolution associated with both, both time steps. Whereas we're gonna take as an approximation, the fact that it is not indeed capital G, the net affluent field is indeed not dependent directly on X of T, the particular time history of a particular firing rate, well, associated with a particular neuron. Uh, this assumption, this approximation at first glance may seem a little bit strange, but it actually works fairly reasonable in that the in that capital G, the increment in capital G is, is typically much greater than that with it associated with, with capital G is, is typically a lot greater than that with associated with X. And we in fact can kind of show that it is uh, fairly accurate in, in various different regime, regimes, specifically when lambda uh, is odd. Uh, this approximation allowed us to be able to write the variance of the system. And we take note the fact that since the system is ultimately uh, a center Gaussian of, of mean zero, all of the dynamics involved are indeed captured by the variance. And this allowed us to write the variance of the system as a simple covariance matrix and define it as, as ultimately basically a, sim a simple system of ODEs that can then be solved fairly straightforward and using classical techniques. Um, in fact, we can even uh, straightforwardly um, allow us to get some numerical solutions associated with the, the ODE. So here, what I'm showing you right now are some of the numerics that we've indeed run so thus far on it. And we can indeed see, so we're comparing here the solutions to our ODE to just a stochastic simulation. Now we're only doing it for uh, N equals a thousand right now, which is fairly kind of low uh, when we're talking about models that really work in the large N limit. We, we can see even with such a low N, um, the model seems to be converging quite well, um, finding some sort of equilibrium in the system. And in fact, we even, uh, ran some numerics where we tried uh, some uh, sinusoidal input, which is kind of fairly reasonable uh, assumption, understanding that one, one region of the brain might, might, might introduce uh, sinusoidal um, input into another region of the brain. And once again, we do see rather a nice convergence of our model into some sort of equilibria of the sinusoidal state of the, our system of, o, our, our, our uh, capture system of ODEs with the stochastic simulation in this case. Um, and kind of a big part of what we're doing is that this uh, simple system that I kind of just showed you in the spatially homogeneous case can now be extended to the spatially uh, heterogeneous case. So if we now introduce a new variable associated with the connections, a spatial variable on uh, S1 or on a ring. So we have a theta term that now uh, associates the kind of the, <clears throat> excuse me, the um, spatially de spatial dependence of the, of the, uh, of the, of the um, variance, uh, which we require to be symmetric for the covariance nature of it. Uh, this, is, this is very um, kind of, has been done and is very similar to work that has been done by Goldman and Lim in 2013 and Darian and Rosenbaum in 2014. I know um, Mr. Rosenbaum is going to be speaking to me, uh, speaking uh, just after me. Uh, so I hope I, I hope I'm rep uh, representing things correctly here. 
So by introducing this kind of spatial uh, dependence into our system, and once again, we're making a, the same kind of assumption as previously, we're gonna make the approximation that the expected increment in the field is independent of the X variable. This produces limiting equations similar to what we had previously, except now the covariance depends on the orientation as well. Uh, we obtain from this coupled integral differential equations for the variance. So these are very similar to the ones that we found for the not for the in uh, the in the homogeneous spatial case, except now we have terms, these equations uh, in, uh, include a spatially dependent, uh, spatially dependent terms. And, they, and although they kind of appear somewhat, uh, you know, somewhat uh, complicated at first glance, they're actually quite tractable using um, very standard, again, standard kind of dynamical uh, methods. And in fact, they're kind of reminiscent of, of the wilson Cowan equations in that ultimately, they are just convolutions over the, over the various variables. We're just con convoluting in order to. Uh, as before, we're able to run some sort of um, numeric simulations for it. And I, I hope this is, is a little bit hard to see. I hope the, uh, the screen can be seen fairly reasonably well. So we're going to present the results here for sinusoidal initial conditions. And we're using a, uh, a row term, the spatially term, which is very consistent with, again, other, others that have done in, uh, in the literature, in, in essence, a, a form of a cosine uh, spatial variable. And once again, we can kind of see, even at the low end limit, we're already kind of getting fairly decent um, convergence and stability in our, in, in, our, in our model. So, so here I've kind of tried to present at least an outline of kind of our work, which represents a low dimensional autonomous. So not capturing the, you know, not having the dependence of the time delays as found in some of the kind of earlier models, set of ordinary differential equations that are characterizing the variance of the random neural networks and was hopefully able to kind of at least our even our initial um, numerics were able to kind of demonstrate that they are indeed uh, seem to be fairly consistent uh, this far. Uh, we kind of were able to because of the simplicity of our of this model, we're able to both um, do work in both a spatially homogeneous, but as well as kind of very easily extended to a spatially heterogeneous case. And once again, the model seems at least at our initial glance right now seems to be fairly consistent as of now. Um, obviously a lot more numerics kind of testing needs to be done. In fact, some of the numerics that are presented to you today were produced uh, very recently. So we still kind of uh, hope to do a lot more kind of uh, work with that, including trying to take things up to a kind of a larger end limit here. Uh, also, um, again, because of the nature and the tractability of our equations, we really be able hope to be able to, sh to study a little bit more rigorously the oscillations that can be arise in these kind of neural, neural networks. Plus we are working uh, on kind of more analytically proving the existence of things like bump attractors in our, in our uh, balanced neural fields. Now, I, I, I know I, I probably glossed over quite a bit <laughs> with this so far. So um, I apologize for that. And uh, all, the, all the details and things will be forthcoming in, in the paper that we, we hope to have soon. We're more than happy to kind of forward, forward that to anybody who's kind of interested in that. Okay, I, I would really like to um, thank so much uh, people involved with this. First and foremost, Pedro Villanova from the Stevens Institute. Uh, he was he's the one that handled all our numerics that I kind of presented to you today, both the, the ODE solutions as well as the stochastic simulation. So his work was kind of absolutely key to what we're doing here. I also uh, can't thank enough my PhD ad advisor James, uh, not only for his insight. Uh, and guidance in this research, but also first and foremostly his uh, seemingly infinite patience with me as I kind of try to nav navigate this. And like I said, um, I know it was kind of a little brief uh, today with, with this, but I hope uh, if anybody's kind of interested in more of the details, will hopefully all be fleshed out in our kind of forthcoming paper. 
So I thank you so much for your time for listening to me today. And if there are any questions, I'd, I'd love to uh, love to hear them. Please speak up, uh, Jonathan. Yeah, um, you referred a couple of times to being able to do things with the ODE model using like standard dynamical systems methods. And um, that model sort of flashed by a little fast. So can you give an, a specific example of like something you can show about the ODE model that you ended up with? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, apologize for uh, moving too, uh, rather quickly through it. Um, so the ODE model uh, reduces again to kind of like just a system of ODEs. In fact, I uh, apologize, I should probably have a little bit more explicit uh, a slide with a little bit more explicit form of them here. They're in essence look uh, very similar to the ones, the uh, spatially inhomogeneous ones here, where we just get the system of kind of integral differential equations. Of course, in this case, we have these, I'm showing you with the spatial variable here, but even in the simpler uh, spatially homogeneous case, we, you know, that's all simplified further. Uh, and we could, again, so we can kind of analyze the system of ODEs in, you know, again, fairly, elementary, even dynamical system kind of approaches, we can try to, uh, well, we're, we're, we're in the middle of, of trying to analyze them for, you know, their analytically find equilibria, and we're looking for phase transitions, things like that uh, amongst the system of ODEs. I, I don't so know if that answered. So an example would be just simply looking at for the equilibrium points and checking their stability, but then you don't specify L and K, so. Yeah, sorry, okay. yeah, I, I, I didn't do that here within, here within uh, the slides. Um, I, guess, I, hate, I hate to keep referencing, but in the, in, the, in the forthcoming paper, all of that is kind of a little bit more fleshed out because they are, they are the self, um, self consistent with the, with the um, covariance terms. So they are self consistent uh, integrals uh, with our distribution and the variance terms. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Hi, thanks for the uh, thanks for the nice talk. Um, I think my question is is maybe a little similar to John's. Um, I'm wondering how the um, how the single unit dynamics show up in your resulting ODEs for the covariance. Like, are these um, you kind of at the beginning mentioned that that this might be extensible to other other kinds of models? So, how does that um, or how would that play out? Uh, I'm sorry. Can you can you um, repeat the question? Yeah, I, um, sure. I'm I, I'm wondering how the single unit dynamics, right, where which for this rate network are just the the leak term, how those show up in these ODEs? Are those um, and and how modifications to those single unit dynamics would change the ODEs for the covariance? Right, so, so the covariance or the covariance of the, the you know, the, the large n average. So, so these are still mean field equations, right? Random uh, balanced uh, mean field equations. So these, so we're, we're since, since it's ultimately, uh, we can show a little more rigorously that the ultimate dynamics of the system are a centered Gaussian. So kind of all the, um, dynamics are captured in the variance here and that we are kind of showing, uh, well, these ODs kind of capture the dynamics of the variance of the, these net affluent, these net afferent uh, kind of regions for the, um, for, for the system. I, I don't know if I'm making myself more clear. Yeah, maybe we can talk more um, offline about it. Okay, great. Looks forward. Yeah, we have one minute. So just very quickly, um, the, the variance is, because it's linear, the, the variance will decompose into the sum of two variances. So one is the, this is the variance of the uncoupled system and one is the variance of the coupled system. So yeah, the like the tau, the leak parameter will pop up in the second variance for the uncoupled system. So it's, it's basically linear, but, but they, they couple in turn via the gain function. So I don't think there's a simple answer about how the, Tau will shape the dynamics. It depends on the other parameters as well.
Okay, well, thanks again, Moshe. That was great. Um, appreciate that. So we now have to move quickly to our next speaker, Olivia. Um, so Olivia, hopefully, you, if you can stop sharing, Moshe, and hopefully Olivia will be able to share her slides. Okay. Um, so actually, you should tell me if I'm like over time because I, I plan for 25. Um, oh, okay, yeah, so 25 including <laughs> questions. Okay. I said sorry. it was 25 plus five. So. Oh, sorry, okay. <laughs> Uh, I'm gonna try to um, yeah to go a bit faster or just like stop me at some point. <laughs> okay, uh, so thank you very much uh, for the invitation, and I want to say that all the work uh, I will present uh, was done in collaboration with Brent Um So currently, it's possible to record uh, from multiple brain areas uh, simultaneously and from um, many tens of neurons in each area. And so we can ask, we can start to ask the question, how does activity propagate between brain areas? And this is a long-standing question in the field of theoretical neuroscience. So initially it had been um, uh, addressed using uh, fully fit forward, fully fit forward networks uh, with random uh, connections between layers. And in those types of, of network, it has been observed that either um, the spiking activity fully synchronized as it propagates down the layer or it disappears. And uh, this is at odds with experimental recordings of the ventral visual pathways that have shown that uh, activity in different area uh, stays uh, pretty much irregular. So then uh, it has been observed that uh, if we introduced recurrent excitatory and inhibitory connections in our network, uh, we can generate an asynchronous state. Uh, so basically, uh, this is due to the fact that um, the excitatory input is balanced by an uh, inhibitory input into each neuron onto the network. And that's why we can get this uh, irregular asynchronous uh, spiking activity. And uh, this yields um, a distribution of spike count correlation, uh, which is rather broad, as is observed experimentally. However, the mean goes as one over n and the variance as one over square root of n. And this is at odds with uh, experimental results uh, that have shown that indeed um, the distribution of the spike on correlation is rather broad and its mean is close to zero. However, it's, high, it's, um, it's positive and significantly different from zero. Um, so then um, so some uh, specially organized uh, network have been introduced, um, among others by uh, Robert uh, Rosenbaum, who is going to talk uh, just after me. And basically, when we are in this uh, specially organized network, um, we can set our network um, in a in a in a in a parameter regime uh, where the recurrent um, projections are broader than the feed forward connections. And when that's the case, uh, we we cannot be in an asynchronous regime. Uh, so basically, we need the opposite to be in the asynchronous regime. We need the feed forward connections to be broader than recurrent connections. Um, but when, uh, when we have both recurrent connections, we are in this interesting uh, regime uh, where we can move uh, from a stable, irregular looking spiking activity uh, with, a, with a mean spike and correlation, uh, which is close to zero, but uh, slightly positive. Uh, towards a pattern forming regime where we really see um, complex spatial temporal dynamics. And uh, this yields uh, even broader um, spike on correlation distribution with a higher uh, mean. And so in my work, uh, I will only uh, work in, uh, in um, I will work with a three layer uh, network with specially organized connections. And I will always be uh, in a non-asynchronous regime. So I will always have uh, the feed forward uh, connections which are narrower than the recurrent connections. And so I, I, I'm, never, I'm never technically in the asynchronous regime, but uh, I can move between the stable and the pattern forming regime. Um, so in the input layer, I have homogeneous uh, Poisson processes, uh, which are homogeneous, homogeneous in space and in time. And uh, each layer is feed forward connected to the next. Uh, through this uh, feed forward connections, which have a broadness of sigma feed forward. And then uh, the sender and the receiver layer uh, consist of excitatory and inhibitory neurons, uh, which are recurrently connected uh, 
with Brodner sigma E and sigma I. And uh, these neurons are organized on a 2D grid um, with uh, periodic boundary conditions. And so uh, using this network um, as, a, as a modeling tool, uh, we can ask the question, how does communication between sender and receiver uh, is affected by emergence of complex dynamics either in the sender or the receiver? Um, so first of all, uh, we can, uh, we can uh, look at what happens uh, when we destabilize the EI balance um, in the receiver, in this case, especially by increasing the broadness of the recurrent inhibitory connections. And we see that uh, even if um, our sender area is set in the intrinsically stable regime, then we can have emergence uh, of complex spatiotemporal patterns of activity in the receiver. Uh, now we can do um, the, the opposite. So now we destabilize the EI balance uh, in the sender RE and we keep the receiver area in the intrinsically stable regime. So we have uh, emergence of uh, complex spatial temporal patterns in the sender. And because we have this uh, feed forward connections, which are also spatially organized, uh, basically we, we see that uh, these patterns are propagated uh, to the receiver layer. Um, so, so then we were interested to find some kind of global measure of the neural dynamic of the within area neural dynamics. Um, so, what we were interested in uh, was uh, to assess within area shared dimensionality, and uh, to do that, um, basically uh, we um, we imprinted a, a disk with a given radius onto our grid of cells, and. Uh, out of this disk, we, we would pick uh, randomly 50 neurons, uh, which are responsive enough to the task. And then, uh, so the reason why 50 neurons is because it's, um, it is the order of magnitude of the number of neurons, which, which can be um, uh, experimentally recorded in a brain area. And then uh, we would uh, compute uh, the, the full covariance matrix C and through factor analysis, uh, we can separate it into a shared component, C shared and private component, C private. Uh, so C private is simply a diagonal matrix with individual normal variances. And in this work, we are interested by the shared covariance matrix. So we can apply singular value decomposition. And then uh, basically we obtain the shared eigenvectors in the, in the columns of U and uh, the shared eigenvalues um, in this diagonal, diagonal matrix lambda. And uh, participation ratio, which is uh, the measure uh, we are using to estimate our uh, within area shared dimensionality, uh, is defined as the first moment of the eigenvalue, shared eigenvalue squared divided by the second moment. And uh, visually, uh, what it means is that uh, if one eigenvalue is much stronger than the other eigenvalue, um, this indicates that the activity looks like an elongated blob in, in this um, high dimensional neural space. And so this would yield a, a low participation ratio or low dimensionality. On the other hand, um, if the lambda i are very similar to each other, um, this is reflected by a, a, a big like hypersphere of activity in this uh, high dimensional neural space. And uh, this would yield a high dimensionality or high uh, participation ratio. Um, so first of all, uh, we can, uh, we can um, investigate uh, the case where the sender is in the intrinsically stable regime. And what we observe is that as we increase um, the disk radius from which we sample uh, the 50 neurons, um, the, shared the estimated shared participation ratio increases. Um, but even when we, we pick neurons from the full uh, grid, uh, we observe that uh, the shared participation ratio is uh, much below the theoretical upper bound of 50. Uh, so um, this really shows basically that um, the shared participation ratio value in itself uh, doesn't really have a meaning. Uh, but what we are interested in is more how it is modulated uh, by different uh, neural dynamics. So now if we look uh, at the receiver area and um, 
as we uh, destabilize the EI balance by increasing uh, the recurrent inhibitory connection uh, sigma i, we observe that this has the effect uh, to decrease uh, the, estimate, the estimated dimensionality in the receiver. Uh, so what is interesting now is that uh, we can do the same type of analysis uh, in the in the scenario where um, patterns uh, emerge in the sender and they are inherited uh, in the receiver. And we observe that uh, the shared participation ratio, which is estimated in the receiver, uh, looks very similar in both cases. So by only analyzing the receiver activity, um, there's no way to tell if the shared variability emerges from our current connection, as it is the case in here, or if it is inherited from the center, as it is the case here. Um, OK, uh, so now it's, it, it's really nice because we have um, this uh, modeling framework, and we have this. Uh, the simple parameter that we, that we can modify uh, to destabilize the EI balance a little bit more, a little bit less. Uh, but if we record from a brain area, we cannot know a priori what are the, the parameters of the network we are studying. Um, so we needed uh, some sort of order parameter for the degree of pattern formation. And uh, a natural, um, a natural way to address this question is uh, to compute a uh, spatiotemporal um, uh, Fourier transform and to get uh, the power for each combination of uh, temporal frequency omega and uh, spatial wave number k. And uh, you can see that uh, for different uh, broadness of the recurrent inhibitory connections, uh, we have a different uh, spatiotemporal signature of the neural dynamics. And uh, I should note that uh, the scale uh, is different uh, for each plot. So the, the maximum uh, is increasing as, uh, as we have uh, more and more EI destabilization. So it seems that uh, the peak of power uh, uh, seems to be a good order parameter for degree of pattern formation. And interestingly, um, the signature of this uh, spatial temporal dynamics is, is very different for uh, for different sigma i. So uh, now I'm going to use this uh, peak of power as other parameters for the degree of pattern formation. And I'm interested to understand how does pattern formation affect uh, the communication between brain areas, so between sender and receiver in this case. So uh, to address this question, uh, I, um, I uh, used a method which has been developed uh, by Semedo and colleague. And uh, so basically uh, the, the, the aim is to try to predict uh, the activity in V2 uh, using uh, the, the, the activity in V1. And um, they have shown uh, that uh, using a few uh, predictive dimensions, uh, which are like a subspace of the V1 activity, uh, they could predict uh, very well uh, the activity in V2, and that instead they would need much more uh, dominant dimension uh, in V1 uh, to predict uh, V2. Um, so uh, this is uh, basically a reduced rank regression uh, measure uh, between the sender activity S and the receiver activity R. And so this reduced rank regression uh, matrix um, is constrained to have a low rank, uh, which is M. And then uh, this uh, regression matrix is a low rank approximation of the ordinary least square solution. And then uh, to um, assess uh, predict, uh, predictive performance of the communication subspace, uh, we take the average normalized square error over 20 cross validation folds. OK. Um, so basically, uh, we can look at our first network uh, where uh, we have emergence of patterns uh, in the receiver. And uh, we see that on the x-axis, we have our other parameter for the degree of pattern formation. Um, so as we have more and more pattern formation in the receiver, the prediction performance of the communication subspace uh, decreases. Uh, however, uh, now if we look at our uh, second type of network uh, where we have um, emergence of patterns in the sender 
and um, and these patterns are inherited in the receiver, uh, we see that as we have um, more and more um, um, as the peak of power in the receiver increases, um, the prediction performance uh, increases. So we have like different effects uh, on the on the communication between the two brain areas, uh, depending on on the scenario in which we are. Um, so actually, it seems that the matching of dimensionality in the sender and receiver um, is a better predictor of communication quality. So now uh, on the on the x-axis, instead of uh, of uh, looking at these other parameters of uh, neuronal dynamics, um, I uh, I uh, I plot the 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 difference between the shared participation ratio in the sender and the receiver, and we observe that if there's a mi mismatch in dimensionality. Um, the prediction performance of the communication subspace uh, is pretty low. Uh, on the other hand, uh, if there's a good match in dimensionality between the sender and the receiver, uh, the prediction performance of the communication subspace is high. So this we can uh, conceptually uh, depict in this way. Uh, so here, uh, our sender is in the, in, in the stable regime. Uh, so it looks like um, very high dimensional manifold in this uh, high dimensional neural space. Um, but as we have more and more fatal formation in the receiver, we see that we saw that um, it has the effect to decrease uh, the shared um, participation ratio in the receiver. And so there's a mismatch in dimensionality, and that's why uh, we have poor communication. On the other hand, uh, when we have emergence of spatial temporal patterns in the center, we already have like a low dimensional manifold. Um, in this high dimensional neural space in the center. And um, this uh, low dimensionality is propagated to the receiver. And that's why we have, um, we have a good match in dimensionality and this yields uh, faithful communication. Uh, but now the interesting question is, uh, is the matching of dimensionality uh, really the in only important criteria? And uh, until now, uh, I always destabilize the network uh, using the, uh, I, I destabilize the network spatially uh, by increasing uh, sync by eye. Uh, but we know that uh, we can destabilize this network in very, in different ways. Uh, so another way to destabilize the network is actually just to increase uh, the time constant of the inhibitory neurons, because this also, um, um, doesn't let the inhibitory neurons track the excitatory neurons so faithfully, and that's why we, we have a destabilization of the EI, EI balance. And so uh, now we ask the question, what happens when both the sender and the receiver are destabilized in different ways? Um, so I start with a network uh, where the sender is destabilized uh, temporarily, and then um, the receiver is destabilized destabilize uh, spatially. Uh, so in this network, we have uh, different patterns that emerge in the sender and the receiver. And we are going to um, compare this network uh, to a network where there's only um, uh, emergence of um, temporal patterns in the sender and uh, the receiver is in intrinsically uh, in the stable regime. So that's a, a network where patterns emerge in the sender only. Um, so, uh, as expected uh, by design, um, the, the match of dimensionality uh, in both uh, network uh, is pretty good. So, if we look at the difference in the shared participation ratio in sender and receiver, it's, it's close to zero in both cases. Um, so, since we have a good match in dimensionality in both cases, uh, we, we would ex expect a priori uh, that we have good communication. Uh, in between sender and receiver in both cases. Um, however, it's not the case. Um, so um, basically uh, when we have new patterns that emerge in the receiver, uh, we observe that it has the effect to uh, strongly decrease uh, the prediction performance of the communication subspace. Um, so my intuition there was that um, the alignment of the manifolds between sender and receiver um, uh, was not as good uh, when different patterns emerge in both uh, area. 
so to investigate if it's a, if it's the case, um, I used uh, um, a method based on canonical correlation analysis, uh, which has recently been used by Caligo and colleague. Uh, so basically, the idea is that um, they were recording from um, from the same brain areas on brain area on different days. Uh, so they had like different neurons in, uh, in in on each day, and they would just project uh, the activity on each day in a low dimensional um, manifold, and then uh, trench, so try to realign um, these two um, the the projected latent dynamics on uh, on different days, and basically if the uh, canonical correlations. Uh, are high, it means that it's possible to well align um, this um, this uh, uh, projection on the low dimensional manifolds. And uh, if canonical correlations are low, it means that um, um, they cannot be well aligned. So in my case, uh, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to um, align on the latent dynamics in the sender and the receiver. Five minutes till next speaker, Olivia. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Um, okay. So, so basically, uh, what we see is that um, if we look at the difference in canonical correlation in the case where patterns emerge in the sender only, and where patterns emerge in the sender and the receiver, uh, we see a, a positive difference. So it means that um, in the first case, uh, where patterns emerge in the sender only, uh, it's possible to align well. Uh, the latent dynamics in the sender and receiver. And um, in, the, in the second case where new patterns emerge in the receiver, uh, we have a misalignment uh, of, the, of, the, of the manifolds. Um, so basically, uh, we also need a good alignment uh, of, the, of, the, of the, we, do, we don't only need a, a good match of dimensionality between sender and receiver, but we also need uh, a good alignment uh, of the manifolds between sender and receiver. Okay, uh, so this is a summary uh, of what I uh, have uh, said so far. Uh, so we need uh, a good match of dimensionality and a good alignment um, of uh, the latent dynamics to have uh, faithful communication. Uh, now, uh, it's a little bit surprising uh, because we know that uh, our network has strong uh, fit forward connections uh, between layers. Um, so we, we, it's, it's kind of surprising that the communication between sender and receiver uh, seems to be poor. Um, <clears throat> so here uh, we were looking in particular at a case uh, with um, low prediction performance of the communication subspace. So it's a case where we have a mismatch of dimensionality, we have emergence of patterns in the receiver. And uh, we freezed on the spiking activity in the sender and used different um, initial conditions uh, for, the, for the membrane potential um, in the receiver. And we see that uh, macroscopically, the activity looks very similar for both trials. And actually, um, a weak perturbation um, only yields um, macroscopic chaos. Um, so to conclude, um, a mismatch in dimensionality or in alignment of shared variability in sender and receiver uh, disrupts uh, communication. Uh, however, the receiver is always effectively driven by the sender in our network. Um, so uh, it shows that linear measures have limited applicability when elucidating the flow of information in neural system with complex dynamics. Uh, and with that, uh, I want to thank uh, the funding sources and, of course, uh, Brent. And uh, if you're interested, uh, this work is, is um, as a preprint on the Bari archive. And I'm very happy to take any questions. Thanks so much. Do we have, we have time for a quick question? I had a quick question. Um, so I, I didn't fully really explain what, what are the mechanisms behind the, the shared variability exactly? I like, are you able to sort of elucidate a bit more about that? Um, okay, so let me know if I'm not answering the question. <laughs> um, 
so so basically um in the in the purely um in the purely balanced uh, network um we are in the asynchronous state so all the neurons um are kind of uh, the activity is kind of independent uh, to each other. Um, now, if we if we destabilize uh, this EI balance, uh, we we will have like uh, neurons that are close to each other, which will be more correlated. Um, um, uh, the pairs will be more correlated than neurons that are far from each other because we have this uh, spatially organized um, uh, connectivity. Um, so basically, that's why we have like these blobs of activity. Um, that we see in the in the spike clusters, uh, so that's what we call uh, uh, shared variability. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Thanks again, Olivia. That's uh, very interesting. Looking forward to talking more another time. Um, but we better move to the next speaker. Um, sorry. So if you could unshare your slides, and Robert can start sharing. Uh, I think I already unshared, right? Or oh, maybe it's my computer. Yeah. Okay. Okay, Robert, are you able to share yours? Uh, Hi. Uh, yep. Yeah, can you uh, uh, share your slides? Thanks. Yes. Sorry. Uh, my um, um, internet's been a little bit wonky lately, and it just so happened to log me out of Zoom uh, uh, exactly at the time that uh, Olivia was finishing, but uh, fingers crossed everything should should go okay, uh, okay from here on out. That was the first time I'd had that problem. So, um, so yeah, thank you for having me today. Um, I'm going to leave my um, leave my camera off to help with this. Um, so. Uh, today I'll actually talk. This is a, a perfect ordering because it's a. This is a. I think a good follow-up for Olivia's talk. Um, Olivia talked about some uh, spatio-temporal dynamics, um, <clears throat> the consequences of some spatio-temporal dynamics in uh, recurrent spiking networks in a balanced state. Um, and I'm actually going to be talking about the exact same type of uh, spatio-temporal dynamics and in, in exactly the same bifurcation. Uh, the only difference is I'm going to be talking about the. Um, uh, what causes the bifurcation and the stability analysis, whereas Olivia was talking about the sort of consequences of it. So um, this was work done with my uh, uh, former PhD student, Ryan Pyle, uh, who did um, all the sort of heavy lifting for this. So I'll be talking about uh, recurrent networks of spiking neurons. Um, so we have an excitatory and an inhibitory population, um, integrate and fire uh, type of models. Uh, with delta synapses, the equations are on the left, but really you can just think of it as a recurrent network of spiking neurons. Um, a lot of you know what it looks like. And at the moment, sorry, my dog is barking at the background to, to top everything else off. Um, and we consider a uh, spatially homogeneous input to the map right now. Could you want to uh, focus on uh, dynamics that arise uh, intrinsically in the network? Um, so. Uh, we'll also uh, be arranging these neurons uh, uniformly on a, a square domain, uh, on a lattice, um, with connection probabilities that decay with distance. So they decay like a Gaussian uh, with distance. Uh, so the connection weights depend on neuron type, um, and the probabilities depend on distance. A lot of these details aren't so important for the things I'm going to be talking about, but all the simulations look like this. So first, I'm going to start off just by showing you what the simulations of this network look like. So in these animations here, uh, the x-axis is the uh, x direction in space, and the y-axis is the y direction in space. Um, so this is a 200 by 200 grid of neurons, so 40,000 excitatory neurons here that we're looking at. Uh, and I'll start with a simulation where um, excitation projects more broadly within inhibition. So the excitatory connections fall off more slowly than inhibitory projections uh, with the distance between neurons. And we see this nice sort of homogeneous spiking state. So even though this is a spatially organized network, it's receiving spatially homogeneous input and the spiking statistics are spatially homogeneous. Then as we broaden inhibition little by little, um, so this is making inhibition just a little bit broader, uh, the same type of uh, changes that Olivia was talking about, we see these spatiotemporal dynamics start to arise. We make uh, uh, inhibition broader still and we see sort of uh, more coherent, uh, uh, sort of interesting looking intricate patterns. 
And even broader inhibition, now we see these um, sort of uh, uh, frozen patterns in, in, in space, these little disks that are frozen in space. Um, so I wanted to understand um, sort of what's going on, what's causing this, uh, this pattern formation uh, in these spiking networks. So we first noticed this uh, phenomenon, actually, I first noticed this when I was uh, doing my postdoc uh, with Brent Doran um, on 1D balance networks. Um, so now arranged on a, a one dimensional space instead of two dimensional space, but everything else more or less the same as what I'm looking at here. Uh, so we reproduced this phenomenon, uh, or we saw this phenomenon in our simulations. Um, but uh, but uh, whereas the, the sort of quenched patterns, which was the last animation I showed there, uh, and in 1D space, it kind of looks like this thing on the left. We captured those. We showed that those arose from a Turing bifurcation. Uh, these traveling wave solutions, which are analogous to the sort of uh, spatio-temporal patterns in 2D, uh, are um, stability analysis that uh, we did using a, a, a neural field equation uh, was not able to capture these, these um, dynamics. Uh, so I set out with my uh, PhD student many years, uh, several years later uh, to try to understand these dynamics better. Um, so first let's think about how to analyze the fixed points and the stability in these networks. Um, so, uh, recurrent spiking networks can be a little bit tricky, um, to analyze, uh, um, very rigorously. Um, so we take what's called a diffusion approximation. Uh, so the idea is to treat the input. So I here is the input to a neuron at location X and time T. Remember X is a two dimensional, um, vector here. It's a vector in two-dimensional space. There's an excitatory and inhibitory uh, component. So the little arrow on top of the variables tells you that there's an EI component. Boldface tells you that there's an XY component. Um, so it consists of a mean input. And then uh, we approximate the variability around that mean uh, with Gaussian white noise. So this is just an approximation. Of course, the uh, um, real uh, uh, statistics of the noise they receive is uh, not Gaussian white noise. Um, but it, it tends to work uh, relatively well in, in a lot of settings. And the mean and the variance now can themselves depend on, on space, right? So there's a spatially dependent mean and a spatially dependent variance. If the rates, or if you assume the rates depend on space, the firing rates, then the mean and the variance can be written as convolutions of some kernels with the rate. So this is actually a matrix of kernels because there's an EI component. Um, so you get a, an equation that looks like this. Um, if you then now plug this into an ODE for the rate, sort of a standard rate model, um, you get what's effectively a neural field equation, right? Um, so this would be exactly a neural field equation that we're used to using if there were no variance term, right? You'd have some nonlinearity phi, and then the mu is actually just some integrals across space. Um, so this is a type of neural field equation. Now we just have an integral for the mean and an integral for the, the variance. So this is a uh, integral differential equation. Uh, in two spatial dimensions, but there's also two uh, dimensions in our R, an E and an I component, right? Um, so in the case that the uh, input to the network, the external input to the network is spatially homogeneous, um, in that case, the, um, the, you have a spatially homogeneous fixed point as well. We'll call that R naught. So it has an E and an I component, but it does not have an X component, right? So there's one E firing rate, one I firing rate that applies across all of space, and that's a fixed point. So we're interested in the stability of that fixed point. That's what's broken uh, in those animations I was showing you. Um, so if you start with this uh, integral differential, set of integral differential equations, um, you can linearize and take the spatial Fourier series. Here we're uh, using uh, periodic uh, uh, boundaries uh, for simplicity in space. And basically you get a linear ODE at each spatial Fourier mode. There's actually two spatial Fourier modes because it's two dimensional space, but that's not so important. And you get a Jacobian matrix at each spatial Fourier mode, right? We'll call that J at N, right? Um, so this tells you about the, this is a um, perfectly mathematically sound way to analyze the stability of fixed points in these integral differential equations. Um, so if we do that, we get a spectrum of eigenvalues that look like this. So in this case where we saw stability of the homogeneous fixed point, uh, indeed we see eigenvalues with purely uh, negative uh, real part. Uh, so things seem to work well. If we go all the way to this case where we get these sort of quenched patterns, um, we see eigenvalues arise with positive real part and zero imaginary part. Um, so this is a um, sort of uh, a prototypical Turing bifurcation uh, that you see in this case. 
and it gives rise as expected um, to uh, sort of spatially quenched patterns. Now, of course, because of noise in the system, uh, these uh, little circles will actually gradually slowly diffuse around. Uh, if we had heterogeneous spatial input, it can quench them. Um, but that's a lot different from these patterns, which are intrinsically sort of moving around uh, through what looks to be a, more of a drift turn than a diffusion term. Um, but interestingly, this uh, stability analysis uh, doesn't capture the instability that we sort of see empirically here. Um, so the stability analysis gives all eigenvalues with negative real part. So it predicts that this fixed point is stable, but there's clearly something going on in the center plot that does not look like this left plot. Um, so what's what's wrong with this picture? Why can't we capture these dynamics with a stability analysis? Um, so I was thinking about this with my uh, former PhD student, Ryan, and also after some uh, um, conversations with uh, Bert, Bart Ehrmantraut um, kind of pointed me in the right direction of, of what to look like, uh, sort of, sorry, what to look at. Um, we started thinking about this and we know that firing rate dynamics actually have a history dependence that's not captured by the simple differential operator, this differential equation. Another way to say this is firing rates um, are the, the system of the firing rates if you view it as a sort of a, a system in the sense of physics. It is time invariant. Um, there's no, nothing special about one point in time versus another point in time, but it's not a dynamical system. You can't predict its future based on its present state. And that's because there are some sort of hidden dynamics coming from the membrane potential uh, that, that uh, cause that to happen. So that causes a sort of history dependence uh, that is not captured by this, by this ODE, right? So one approach to doing this is, is modeling the, the um, sorry, sorry uh, analyzing the stability of the membrane potentials uh, directly instead of the firing rates. But we chose a, a, different, uh, a different approach. We're gonna stick to firing rate space, let the membrane potentials remain hidden, um, but we're going to, uh, try to think about how do we perform stability analysis on a system that's time invariant, um, but is not a dynamical system. So it has some, some delay, delayed effects in it. Um, so if you're familiar with the analysis of delay equations um, or um, yeah, basically delay equations, then, then this might look familiar to you. If you're not, I'll, I'll sort of walk through the basic idea. Uh, so the basic idea uh, to do the stability analysis is we take our firing rates at the fixed point and we apply a small perturbation. You can see that in the picture here. This small perturbation then uh, go, echoes through the system to cause a perturbation in the mean and the variance of the input. Now this is a totally linear operation and it has no time dependence uh, because the mean and the variance are related exactly to the, uh, the firing rates at a particular point in time. But then the mean and variance uh, perturb the firing rates in a way that does have a time dependence. Um, so um, through what are called the susceptibility functions or sometimes linear response functions, uh, which I'll call A for the mean and B um, for the variance, you can compute these through a, a Fokker-Planck formalism, the same formalism we use to compute the, the phi, the, the um, mapping from the fixed point uh, mean and variance to the fixed point firing rate. Um, don't have time to go into the, the details there, but I'm happy to talk offline about it or you can see our paper. Um, so, so now this looks, now we actually have an integral across time, uh, that gives rise to this perturbation, this effective perturbation in the rates. Uh, so putting all this together, we have a self-consistent equation for a perturbation. So this gives you sort of how a perturbation to the rates echoes through the network, uh, it has a, a, a integral across space and an integral across time. So we have two dimensional space and time. We can take the spatial Fourier series and the temporal um, Laplace uh, 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 transform. And uh, we, uh, we get that uh, for this equation, um, the second to last equation here to be satisfied, um, this last equation needs to be satisfied. Uh, this function that we're setting equal to zero is sometimes called an Evans function. Um, and the hat here is the Laplace transform of A, the tilde is a Fourier transform in space. So Laplace in time, Fourier in space, uh, and we need to solve this at all lambda uh, and all pairs of Fourier modes, uh, N1 and N2 that are in this vector N. And uh, wherever we find a solution, the associated lambda is an eigenvalue and the associated Fourier mode is an eigenfunction. Um, so this is actually, this type of analysis was also um, uh, uh, presented in, in uh, uh, this paper by Ledoux and uh, Brunel. Um, but uh, without space. So they looked at this in, in a non-spatial system. So you can view this as a generalization of that approach to a, a, a system in space. Um, 
Okay, so what happens if we perform this analysis? Um, now, um, uh, things seem to work out. Um, so in um, the case where we see the homogeneous fixed point uh, sort of looking stable, um, we get uh, uh, all uh, eigenvalues with negative real part. So the eigenvalue spectrum looks a little more interesting here. Uh, and then as we broaden inhibition, um, we start to see these eigenvalues uh, cross the, um, the uh, uh, imaginary axis here, and we get some eigenvalues with, with positive real part. Importantly, these eigenvalues with positive real part uh, do not have zero imaginary parts. They have non-zero imaginary part. We get a conjugate pair of eigenvalues. <clears throat> and this is what's called a Turing-Hopf bifurcation. Um, it's sort of a mix between a Turing bifurcation, which is where you get, um, uh, which is what happens when you when you have uh, uh, eigenvalues in these spatial systems that uh, cross the the, uh, um, the real axis, uh, and a Turing bifurcation where you get uh, uh, um, eigenvalues that uh, that go from negative real part to complex uh, conjugate with positive real part, and this gives rise to um, spatial temporal patterns like you see. In this picture, uh, you can, if you look at the sort of uh, spatial and temporal frequency of these these patterns, uh, you can uh, get some information about those from the the eigenvalues here. So the unstable eigenmodes, um, which are which are uh, Fourier uh, uh, values, uh, uh, predict the the frequency of the spatial frequency of the the moving dots or whatever you see there, the traveling waves that you see there. You can view these sort of as interactive traveling waves, traveling in different directions and they're colliding all the time. The noise is sort of pushing them together and, and causing sort of a more complex uh, picture than you see with just traveling waves. Uh, let's see, there's a question in chat. Okay, uh, we can, uh, we can uh, uh, I'll answer those questions later. I just wanted to make sure it wasn't about the, the my internet uh, connection or something like that. Um, so, okay, so that's all well and good. We get these pattern formations. So this is, I think, mathematically a cool, you know, what I thought was an interesting thing. We were able to, first of all, show that you can't capture these dynamics with standard rate equations because of this history dependence. And then we were able to describe them using this, uh, this um, other formalism that's, that's often used for delay equations, even though we don't explicitly really have a delay equation here. Um, so, my uh, 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 Ryan, uh, my former PhD student, uh, took this a few steps further. I wanted to look at the sort of dimensionality. This is something that Olivia talked a lot about. We took it a slightly different direction, but uh, uh, similar to what Olivia was talking about, the dimensionality and sort of complexity of these dynamics. So in the stable case, what we did is we, to measure this, what we did is we gave a global input to the network. So just a sine wave. All neurons receive this sine wave input, sort of pushing the rates up and down and in the stable case, we saw the rates. So then we read out the rates. So we, we set up a grid of, I think, a, a 10 by 10 grid of neurons or something like that, and average the rates of those neurons. And that's what you see each one of these rainbow lines here is one of these rate readouts, right? So it's a local readout of the firing rates. We saw they sort of tracked the input. And so then if you, if you try to explain the variance in these local rate readouts, there's a hundred of them. Um, we saw that uh, uh, most of the variance is explained by the first principal component because basically what's happening is all the neurons are doing the same thing, the sinusoid, with some noise around it. So the noise is distributed more evenly across the other principal components. There's a hundred of these principal components, I think, if I remember correctly. Uh, or maybe there's 10 of them, I kind of forgot. No, there's more than 10, I think there's a hundred. Um, so um, then in the unstable case, there's definitely response. So the input does affect the network, um, but not all the neurons are doing the same thing. Some go up during the up phase of the input, some down during the down phase, some up during the down phase, et cetera, et cetera. And it takes more principal components to explain what's going on here, right? Okay, so this could be interesting because this could be used for, for example, performing high, dim uh, high dimensional computations. However, what we saw is that these dynamics are not reliable um, from trial to trial. So what we did here is we did the same exact simulation, the same exact experiment, except we gave the same global input to the network 10 times. So we repeated the same simulation 10 times, each with a different sort of initial condition at the beginning. So the network's doing the same thing, but the noise in the network is randomly sampled, right? And um, um, what we see is that on every trial, each principal component is doing something totally different, except for the first one that's more or less just tracking the input with some, some nonlinearity applied to it, probably due to some sort of shunting. 
Um, so, but all the other principal components, whereas they're, you know, they do explain some of the variability in one trial that's not shared across trials. Uh, so then we realize what, what, what's going on here is that uh, there's a pattern, uh, sorry, uh, um, symmetry breaking bifurcation. And on every trial, it sort of breaks in a different direction. So every trial is doing something totally different. If you think about these spatiotemporal patterns, they're arising from breaking the stability of a homogeneous fixed point. When you break the stability of a homogeneous fixed point, sort of anything could happen. So every time something else, something different is happening. So we modify the simulation by applying an input that varies in time and space. So now different neurons receive a different intensity of the input. And I think also a different polarity, a different sign. And now we get these intricate dynamics. So every principal component is doing something different. So we get this high dimensional, uh, uh, high dimensional dynamics, um, rate dynamics, but it's preserved from trial to trial. So all the trials seem to be doing the same thing. Um, so why, why might this be important? Um, so if you wanted to, to perform a computation with a network like this, one idea, um, sort of a simple idea behind performing uh, computations with recurrent networks is reservoir computing. The idea is you treat the network like a reservoir of dynamics and you train out the features that you want. Uh, but for that to happen, of course, you need them to be high dimensional and reliable to be able to get what you want out of it. So what we did is we trained some readouts from the network and we tried to get those readouts to match a target output. So the target output looks like this thing in red, oh, sorry, the black dashed, and we wanted to train the readouts. So train the weights of these readouts to match the target. Uh, by and we gave the same input to the network 100 times. This is a network uh, input that varies across space and time, the same one I showed before. Uh, well, actually in red here on the right is where it varies across space and time. In blue is where it only varies across time and not space, where, it was, where we saw that it was unreliable. So only in the reliable case does the readout from the network actually match the target. You can see this uh, visually on the left and you can see that measured by the, the mean squared error on the right. So this shows that these, uh, Spatiotemporal dynamics uh, can be useful potentially for performing computations through this reservoir computing uh, framework. Um, but since it's a symmetry breaking bifurcation, the only way to get to be sufficiently reliable to perform these dynamics is using a, a spatially heterogeneous input. And I think another uh, kind of thing I like about this project is the uh, sort of um, uh, insights about uh, performing uh, stability analysis on, on rate networks or on. Uh, uh, the idea that uh, uh, rate dynamics, I guess, are not necessarily dynamical system because they rely on these, these hidden variables. That's important for performing stability analysis, but we should also think about it um, uh, in terms of uh, when we're analyzing uh, data, um, uh, um, it might not always be well-informed to fit firing rates to a dynamical system model uh, without hidden variables. So that's all I had to say but I'm happy to answer some questions. Thanks so much. Do you want to answer the question from Ernest? Oh, Mondier? sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's right. Yeah, so, uh, uh, so um, uh, Ernest asked if this uh, failure of the firing rate equations to capture the, oh, to capture the Turing instability. So the um, firing rate equations capture the Turing instability, but not the Turing Hopf. Uh, so in the 1D equations, this is from this, uh, this paper in 2014, um, on the left is a Turing bifurcation, and this was captured by the rate equations, the, the neural field equations, because you see a, a positive eigenvalue at a particular eigenmode, uh, and uh, you can't see this in the picture, but the, um, this is the max real part, but the imaginary part was zero here. Um, but on the right, uh, we see what's clearly an instability, this traveling wave, um, but uh, the uh, neural field equations predicted stability, the rate equations did. So this 2D and uh, 1D results are, are exactly the same. Thank you, thank you. I, I need... Great, thanks. And you have one more question in the chat. Sure, yeah. Uh, okay, broader inhibition. Um, yeah, that's right. So with broader inhibition, um, uh, you do get, uh, um, the network is sort of, better for uh, reservoir computing, at least in our, for our model, that's what we saw. Um, so in the real world, um, inhibitory neurons, or if they're PV neurons and excitatory are, are uh, pyramidal, uh, the dendrite length of most inhibitory neurons is uh, shorter than most pyramidal neurons. Um, so this, uh, um, 
I think this is, so I'm not a, uh, uh, um, huge expert in the field, but I think this is true of the visual system um, is, is where this result uh, um, uh, is sort of most well confirmed, I guess. Uh, in the visual system, you probably don't want uh, pattern forming dynamics. You're probably not doing something like reservoir computing. Uh, at least in my opinion, it kind of seems like this would be the, the wrong framework for modeling the visual system. I think looking at um, uh, premotor cortex and prefrontal cortex and motor cortex, these generative, um, these uh, yeah, brain, uh, cortical regions that are sort of thought to be generative, generating dynamics for movement and things like that would be more um, the place to look for um, these types of dynamics. Uh, and then the other thing I wanted to mention is that you can get similar um, spatial temporal pattern forming dynamics that are also uh, amenable to reservoir computing um, by um, uh, instead of changing the, the spatial width of, of inhibition, uh, uh, changing the time scale of inhibition. So if inhibition is a little bit slower than excitation, you can get a similar type of, of bifurcation. Um, so it doesn't have to be the, the spatial width. That is, the, the synapses are slower or the neurons really. Yeah, thank you. Thanks again, Robert, very interesting. Um, we better try to go to the next speaker and I hope he's here, uh, Mark Goldman. I'm not sure I see him in the list of participants. Okay. Unfortunately, I've got a feeling he's not here unless, it, 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 I don't know if anyone's got his phone number, if someone can ring him. He's not in the other channel, so. Yeah. Um, yeah, it might have been. <coughs> Somebody could check the other room in case he's in the wrong room by mistake. I don't know. Uh, I, um, I did it, and uh, I cannot see him in the other channel. Yeah, well, I, I know he was keen to chat, so I'm not sure there's something. There's been some mix up, I'd say. Um, did Did you try sending him an email? Maybe I did. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Uh, I could send him a text. Yeah, if you could text his phone, that'd be great. See if he's... And send the coffee also. Yeah, early coffee time, right? I actually had a question for Robert If um, while we're waiting, if that's all right. Um, Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I'm curious. So you make you make the the long the long time the time invariance assumption, right? To look at the the patterns. Um, is there? Do you have any ideas about how you'd proceed on a for shorter times? So without making that assumption of time e equilibrium. Um. So I, I guess I'm not sure what you mean because we're looking at a so we're looking at a, a fixed point. So we're kind of assuming that the fixed point is uh, yeah we're sort of assuming stationarity of the noise and then um, looking at a, a fixed point. So it, like in that sense, there's there's a sort of nothing really varying in time under this under stability, right? Or right. I mean, maybe I'm not understanding because when you, 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 you yeah exactly because you're assuming time stationarity, right? I mean, it's the yeah, same that's as right. what yeah. Komplitsky did in his analysis, right? Yeah, yeah. So we're assuming, yeah, we're assuming stationarity. Um, yeah, we're, we're assuming uh, that the input is is stationary in time, and then uh, basically that the system has reached a, a, a sort of a, a stationary equilibrium, statistically speaking, right? Okay. Uh, that all of the statistics are, are in their sort of stationary state. Um, yeah. So that's this sort of implicit in this this diffusion approximation, right? So we have uh, maybe maybe that's uh, if I go back to there, that'll sort of get to the crux of the. Uh, no, yeah, the it's, it's very. By the way, it's very it's very good work. I'm just um, trying to follow because because um, you I mean you can make diffusion approximation out of equilibrium too, right? I mean, I'm, I'm just wondering uh, yeah. what happened if you had the out of equilibrium. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, so if you're out of equilibrium, um, then, uh, yeah, I'm not sure how that, how that analysis would go. Um, 
because you still want to be looking at a, a fixed point. So, um, so you would you could maybe be looking at a fixed point in the mean, because uh, the stability analysis we're always assuming that the system is at a fixed point and then looking at a perturbation away from it and see if, seeing if that perturbation is amplified right mm -hmm. by the system. Mm -hmm. um, so um, if some of the statistics, so I guess you could look at for you could assume you're at a fixed point in the mean and then have a time have a non-stationary variance. Yeah. I'm not sure. I'd have to think about that, I guess. Yeah, good question. I also have a question, if I may ask, while, while we're waiting. Sure. So um, I'm interested in this uh, point that you mentioned about uh, failure of neural fields to capture the Turing Hof. Um, so my, so in this case, are you, do you have two populations or are you just bunching the excitatory and inhibitory populations together? Uh, yeah, we have we have two populations. There's a there's a excitatory and inhibitory population. They have different connectivity statistics. Uh, and then in the in the uh, in the neural field equation, we we it's a yeah there are two populations in the neural field equation as well. Because one uh, so the, that uh, you know neural fields with two populations, they would typically give you these uh, Turing hop buttons and waves. Yeah, so they can they can um, in certain under certain conditions, but. Uh, um, they don't capture this particular Turing Hopf bifurcation. So they can capture a Turing Hopf bifurcation, for example, by making inhibition slower than excitation in the neural field equation and, and other things like this. Um, so you can you can get Turing Hopf bifurcations in a um, in a um, uh, neural field equation with two populations, but uh, it doesn't capture this particular Turing Hopf bifurcation. Thank you. Because this one arises from the, this one fundamentally arises from the um, the resonance in the uh, spiking neurons. So that's it, the neural field equations completely ignore that resonance. Yeah. So I, I see what I mean. Do I understand correctly? What you're saying is that if you look at the mean field, uh, the mean field equation don't look quite like uh, what a neural field with two components would look like. Is that what you're heading towards? No, the the neural field does have two. Oh, I see. The mean field equation for the for the for the neurons. You mean? Yeah. Yeah. So if you had a the, the problem is we we don't have a sort of analytically rigorous mean field equations for the for the firing rates of the neurons, right? Um, if you were to have one, um, then it would look different. So I think to to capture this properly, what you would need to do is you would need to have you would need to have mean field equations for the membrane potentials. Um, and actually this analysis is sort of equivalent. So what we did is sort of equivalent to doing that, uh, except the um, membrane potentials and this diffusion approximation. So you'd have basically a Fokker-Planck equation with a spatial variable. So you'd have an infinite system of Fokker-Planck equations. That's what the true mean field equation that, that would capture this phenomenon would look like. Um, if that makes sense, you'd have a, yeah. Uh, yeah, a VX, right? And then you'd have a equation for the probability density function of dx. So that's comes into play, but stop me if I'm, if I, if yeah. I should stop. Yeah. And these, um, these uh, susceptibility functions, a and b, those tell you how the firing rate changes in response to a change in the mean or the, or the variance to a perturbation in the mean and the variance. They're kind of like a greens function for the firing rate. Um, but they, but to, to compute these, we actually have to solve a Fokker-Planck equation um, uh, involving the membrane potentials. Yeah, I see this but is you, very impressive same, work. Uh, you had the same Thank phenomenon you. in uh, Roxanne and Grunel in 2005, where they have, I think, a single population of neuron, that the spiking neuron that is oscillating. And so the fine rate model converges to a uh, fixed point, which is uh, whatever stable, let's say. And so you cannot capture oscillations and by adding a delay mm -hmm. like you did, they can capture all the dynamics of the spiking uh, well, well. They can capture most of the dynamics of the finite size model that is oscillating. Uh, okay. Can you can you post a link to that in that chat? Uh, if you, yes. If, you, you. if you're able. Thank you. I can. James? 
Yeah. Yep. What would you like to do? I mean, I'm sorry, I I don't know. He can he confirmed he's coming, but I guess there's some mix up with the times. So I mean, chat, we can discuss what's already been presented or um go to coffee early. It's your choice. Uh, you're the chairman, James. <laughs> Oh, well, it's a shame. I very much wanted to hear Mark's talk. Um, he's done some very good work on balanced networks, but um, I'm not sure if it's me or what's going on, but he, he, I guess he's not able to join. So, so um, can, we, can we perhaps offer him um, the chance to still at some point record the talk and give it to us perhaps? Let's do that. Oh, that'd be I'd fantastic. Be, I'd be very happy to be an audience in that. If he, you know, It doesn't have to be on his his own when he when he speaks and then we can record that and uh and just offer him this how about that that, that well, that'd be great i'll because i'd like to hear that as well so I'll, I'll send him that email and sort that out um so i guess we'll 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 have to i mean it's too late to start his talk anyway i think now yeah. so um even if he turns up now so let's uh go, go to coffee unless you guys want to discuss Anyone want to discuss further with the talks? Any I'll other questions? To channel one and see you later. Okay. okay. Maybe we'll go to channel one. Okay. Well, I guess we'll call it a day, but thanks again for everyone for speaking. I learned a lot from those um, and look forward to reading the papers and being in touch. Thanks all. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Jens, and thanks, thanks to the speaker. And I. Uh... I close the room and we can meet in channel one. Okay. Okay. Thanks all. Bye.